Welcome to the reading of The Issue with the Tsar's Helmet. This book is by Anatoly Fomenko and Gleb Nazovsky. Just one part in the series from the history, fiction, or science collection where they give an interesting take on various historical narratives. This volume raises questions with artifacts from medieval Russia. Do we really know what our past was like? Anatoly Fomenko and Gleb Nizovsky may be closer to the truth than we're willing to realize. They point out a series of interesting facts that can't just easily be explained away. Although this doesn't prevent their opponents from trying, the things you're about to hear in this book quite possibly might blow your mind. And if you're willing to open that mind, you might just start to see the world in a totally different way. Join me, C.B. Garden, as I read The Issue with the Tsar's Helmet. Chapter 1 Arabic Inscriptions Upon Russian Weapons Section 1 Why would Nikita Davidov, a Russian craftsman, decorate the royal helmet with Arabic inscriptions? The medieval weapons decorated by Arabic inscriptions are considered oriental without a shadow of a doubt nowadays. This implies a Middle Eastern origin, Turkish or Persian, and definitely Islamic. Apparently, it is presumed that if a steel blade of a weapon had a phrase from the Quran inscribed upon it, it must have been made by a Muslim craftsman from the Islamic East, where the Arabic cultural tradition had existed for centuries on end. Russian craftsmen are presumed to have been ignorant and inferior in general, and the possibility that they may have known Arabic and written in this language is not even considered by the modern historians. The very spirit of Scaligarian and Malarian history implies that by the 16th century there had already been a long tradition of mutual animosity between the Orthodox Russia and the Muslim Turkey and Persia. Cultural and religious traditions are said to have been radically different and even hostile to one another from the very beginning. However, According to our reconstruction, Russia, Turkey, and Persia had been part of the same great Mongolian empire until the very end of the 16th century. Therefore, the cultural traditions of these countries must have had a great many common elements. In particular, similar methods of forging and decorating weapons. Despite the religious schism between the Orthodox Christianity and Islam, that started in the 9th century, traditions of the state and the military had still remained similar between the 16th and 17th century. There are many facts to prove the above, some of them very illustrative indeed. The Romanovian purge of the Russian history notwithstanding. It turns out that Russian craftsmen had still decorated weapons, even royal weapons, with Arabic inscriptions up until the middle of the 17th century, which had already been the Romanovian epoch. They must have received explicit forbidding instructions at some point in the second half of the 17th century. There have been no Arabic symbols anywhere on the Russian weapons since then. Some of them may have been destroyed. However, the royal weapons that were covered in gold, diamonds, and other gems and also forged by the best court craftsmen, survived, apparently, due to its high material value. However, most of the Russo-Arabic weapons were removed from public sight. Nowadays, some of the dangerous weapons are exhibited in museums, with photographs published at Al. Still, one has to have a very keen attention in order to notice Arabic inscriptions upon Russian weapons. Museum plaques usually tell us nothing about these oddities, and the articles are often exhibited in such a way that the Arab inscriptions can't be seen very well. 
Yuri Yelisiev, pointed them out to us for the first time. Let us turn to the fundamental publication entitled The State Armory. It contains photographs and descriptions of the valuable objects stored in the State Armory of the Muscovite Kremlin. For instance, the so-called Jericho hat, which is a ceremonial helmet worn by the Muscovite czars and made of Damascus steel, can be seen in figure 13.1. In chapter 5 of Kron 6, we give a detailed account of the helmet's origins, as well as the reason it has got a biblical name. Let us now consider the actual helmet more attentively. The steel surface of the helmet is well polished and covered by a very fine golden inlaid pattern. Apart from that, the helmet is decorated with a variety of gemstones, diamonds, rubies, and emeralds. It is known that the Jericho hat was decorated with the gems and the inlaid pattern in 1621, already in the Romanovian epoch, that is. It was made by Nikita Davidov from Murom, a Russian craftsman, the leading craftsman of the armory. The golden inlay pattern is distinctly shaped as the royal crown with the eight-pointed orthodox cross. On the front part of the helmet, we see an enamel depicting the archangel Michael. The top of the helmet is encircled in arabesques or framed Arabic inscriptions. The arabesque that we see in the photograph reads, Vabashir Amumini, or Make the Believers Rejoice, translated from Arabic by T.G. Chernienko. It is a common phrase from the Quran. Thus, Nikita Davidov used the same kind of golden inlay for the Orthodox symbols and the Arabic quotations from the Quran. One must also note the utter absence of Slavic inscriptions on this helmet. Nikita Davidov, a Russian craftsman, had only left Arabic inscriptions on this masterpiece. One must say that the photograph of the Jericho hat, as given in the luxurious album, was made in a very politically correct manner. Most of the arabesque is rendered all but invisible by a spot of reflected light. The next arabesque is in the shade, and therefore, altogether, illegible. The Arabic inscriptions on the Russian helmet are therefore very hard to notice. The commentary does not mention them anywhere at all. However, since they have already been noticed, it is easy enough to read them. The above-mentioned arabesque was read and translated by T.G. Chernyenko, a specialist in Arabic. The meaning of the other arabesque, which encircled the top part of the helmet, remains unknown. Another such example, from the very state armory, is the knife of Prince Andrei Staretsky, son of Ivan III, see figure 13.3. It was made by a Russian craftsman in the early 16th century. The knife is signed in Russian, and the legend says, Prince Andrei Ivanovich, year 7021. This dating translates as, 1513 AD. However, the blade of this knife is also decorated by an Arabic inscription, set in the same canonical Arab script as we find on virtually every oriental weapon. T.G. Chernienko proved unable to read the inscription, since it doesn't contain any diacritic signs. Their absence makes every letter readable in a variety of ways and a text transcribed in this manner can only be interpreted if its approximate content is already known. Otherwise, there are too many interpretation versions to go through. Nevertheless, the disposition of letters and the use of their different forms, which depend on whether the letter is in the beginning, the middle, or the end of the word in Arabic, implies that the inscription has an actual meaning and it isn't a mere decorative pattern of Arabic letters emulating Oriental writing, as the comments are telling us. The authors of the commentary had clearly wanted to keep the readers from thinking that the Russian craftsmen of the 16th century had made a knife with an Arabic inscription as a present for the son of Ivan III. 
This method of declaring embarrassing inscriptions illegible is used by historians quite often and known to us very well. It usually conceals utter reluctance to read inscriptions that contradict the Scaligarian, a Romanovian version of history. We discuss this at length in Cron 5. A propose. Since the inscription on the knife of Andrei Staritsky remains illegible, one cannot be certain about the fact that it is in Arabic. The kind of writing considered Arabic nowadays had also been used in other languages, Turkish and Persian, for example. Could it have been common for the Russian language as well in the epoch of the 15th to 16th century? It turns out that the weapons with Arabic inscriptions had also been made in other countries than Turkey, possible in even greater amounts. We have just seen that the Orthodox Russians had kept the custom of decorating their weapons with Arabic inscriptions up into the middle of the 17th century. We also find Arabic inscriptions on the saber of Prince Mitislavsky, the military commander of Ivan the Terrible. One of the inscriptions translates as, will serve in battle as strong defense. We also find the name of the owner written in Russian. Another thing that we notice instantly is the photograph of the polished plate armor made in 1670 by Grigory Vyadkin, one of the best craftsmen and the best manufacturer of weapons and armor in the second half of the century. For Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich, the armor is complemented by a helmet. The two had clearly constituted a single ensemble although the commentary makes no separate reference to the helmet. The inscriptions on the helmet are amazing. They are all in Arabic and distinctly recognizable as quotations from the Quran. The inscription on the nose guard says, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. The bottom of the helmet is decorated by a whole verse from the Quran, Surah 2, 256. All of these inscriptions were translated by T.G. Chernyenko. They are set in the canonical Arabic script and their interpretation does not present any problems. Oriental sabers were wielded by Minin and Pozharsky, famed heroes of the Russian history. The sabers must have really been Russian, but decorated with Arabic inscriptions. As we have witnessed during our visit to the State Armory in June of 1998, the inscription on Minin's saber isn't even Arabic. The script is completely unfamiliar. The explanatory plaque suggests that the weapon to be of an Egyptian origin. In reality, both sabers are most likely to be Russian. A visit to the Armory revealed a large number of exhibited Russo-Arabic weapons, it would be very interesting indeed to take a look at the storage rooms. One gets the idea that most Russian weapons were covered in Arabic or illegible inscriptions in the Middle Ages. This guess is confirmed by the material cited in Annex 2 of Kron 7. Why are Russian weapons decorated with Arabic inscriptions presumed to be of Turkish or Persian origin today? When the artwork is obviously Russian, it is presumed that the inexperienced and ignorant Russian craftsmen were faithfully copying the Oriental and Western European originals mechanically as artwork without delving into their real meaning and used Arabic phrases for adorning the weapons and the armor of the Russian czars and warlords. Who would wear them proudly, unaware of the meaning and paying no attention to the reserved smiles of the enlightened Arabs and the even more enlightened Westerners. The above is most likely to be incorrect. Most of these Russian weapons with Arabic inscriptions must have been made in the 16th and even the 17th century by Russian craftsmen in the Horde, which had also comprised Ottomania or Atamania. Most of these Russian weapons were made in Moscow. Tula, Ural, etc., were declared Damascene, Oriental, 
Western, and so on, which had led to the popular misconception that the Russians had preferred foreign weapons back in the day. Domestic weapons had presumably been so scarce and of poor quality, although it is quite obvious that every strong military power had used weapons of its own. Another forgotten fact is that the medieval Damascus is most likely to identify as to Moscow, the city of Moscow, written together with a definite article. Russians had also made weapons adorned by Latin inscriptions. At the very least, they had used Romanic characters. Such is, for instance, the precious saber of Damascus steel made by the Russian craftsman Ilya Prozvit in 1618. There is an inscription that runs across the entire blade and uses Romanic characters. Unfortunately, we haven't managed to read and interpret it, as the photograph in 187 isn't large enough to make out all the letters. See figures 13.6 and 13.7. We are usually told that all these Oriental and Western weapons were given to the Russian Tsars by the Oriental and Western rulers as presents. We don't see this to be the case. In the cases related above, at least, certain individual weapons may, of course, have been received as presents. However, it has to be said that the items a priori, known to be presents or souvenirs from the Orient, aren't decorated by any inscriptions at all as a rule. According to the annotations provided by the armory, see Annex 2 of Kron 7. Alternatively, the inscriptions could be Slavic or Greek, such as the nature of the precious bow cover brought from Istanbul by the Russian merchants as a present for Tsar Alexei Mikhailovich, or the royal neck piece made for the Tsar by the craftsmen of Istanbul in the 1650s, or the precious mace given to Tsar Mikhail Fyodorovich as a present by Sultan Murad in 1620. In all of the above mentioned cases, we see either Greek inscriptions or none whatsoever. The historians of today are trying to convince us that the Arabic inscriptions upon old Russian weapons are explained by the fact that said weapons were received by the Russian czars and warriors as presents from foreigners who wrote and spoke in Arabic. We are beginning to realize that this explanation is the furthest thing from the truth. Moreover, it turns out that the Russian czars themselves would give weapons with Arabic inscriptions to foreigners as presents. A very illustrative example of the above is as follows. In 1853, Alexander Tereshenko made a report of the excavations in Sarai before the Imperial Academy of Sciences that concerned the relics of the Desht Kipchak Kingdom. This is what he said in his report. A special chamber, known as the Armory, contains a number of rare and noteworthy Asian weapons, including a number of sabers received as presents from our monarchs. There are weapons with Tartar, Persian, Arabic, and Kufic inscriptions. Among them, the blade of a saber received by one of Jangar's ancestors from Tsar Mikhail Fyodorovich with the following Arabic inscription set in gold. Birakmeti Eliyahi, Talya Naknul, Malik El Azim Khan, Ve Emir Kebir, Mikhail Fyodorovich, Mamalike Kul Vilyata Urus, which translates as We, Mikhail Fyodorovich, Supreme Ruler, Tsar and Governor, by the glory of God. Mark that the Arabic version of the title of Mikhail Fyodorovich Romanov contains the word Khan. Thus, the Russian Tsars, including the first Romanos, had customarily made presents of precious weapons to their own subjects or to foreigners, whereupon they had ordered the craftsmen to make Arabic inscriptions in gold. The above passages about Arabic inscriptions present upon the Russian weapons don't only apply to the armory of the Kremlin. Another example is the Museum of 
Alexandrovskaya village, the town of Alexandrov nowadays. Namely, the weapons and armor of a Russian warrior exhibited in the Raspyatkaya church. We visited this museum in July 1998. The exhibited objects include chainmail, a helmet, and a shield. The explanatory plaque reports the items in question to be of Russian origin. Indeed, we see the entire helmet to be covered by artwork depicting fantasy animals, birds, and horsemen, very Russian in style and resembling the famous cathedral wall carvings from the Vladimir and Suzdal Russia. The nose guard of the helmet has got a four-point cross at the end, resembling the dome of a church topped with a cross. All of the above allows us to identify the helmet as a Russian piece of armor without any doubts left about its origins. At the same time, the helm has got an Arabic inscription upon it, a wide stripe that covers the entire perimeter. The explanatory plaque doesn't say a word about it, and quite naturally, doesn't provide anything in the way of a translation either. Next to the helmet, we see a shield. Once again, there is Arabic writing all over the perimeter. The rest of the surface is covered in artwork that is purely Russian in style. We have taken several photographs of the shield in order to represent as many fragments of the Arabic inscription upon it as possible. We cannot call the armaments in question Muslim in the modern meaning of the word, seeing as how the Muslim art has apparently had a strict taboo concerning the graphical representations of people and animals ever since the 18th century. Yet the artwork of this Russo-Arabic helmet contains figures of animals and people also mounted. If we study figure 13.12 attentively, we shall see a very clear image of an Amazon a woman mounted waving a scimitar above the nose guard on the right. Why don't the museum workers exhibit medieval Russian helms with Slavic inscriptions and nothing but? Could it be that there are very few such pieces to be found amidst the Russo-Arabic majority? What if the armaments in question had been typical for medieval Russia? The items we see must have been very common indeed yet we find them covered in Arabic script, or another one considered illegible. This makes the plot thicken even more. We see the same to be the case in the Moscow Museum complex of Kolomskoye. We have visited the halls of the front gate on 23rd of June, 2001, and seen the two old Russian helmets exhibited there, figures 13.2a, 13.2b, and 13.2c. The inscriptions we find on both of them are exclusively in Arabic. There isn't a single piece of armor with Slavic lettering in sight. Both museum plaques tell us tersely that the Russian craftsmen had copied these helmets from Oriental originals. Russians must have been truly wild about all things Oriental, seeing as how they kept on copying them all the time. Thus, most of the inscriptions found upon the Russian medieval weapons are rendered in a script presumed to be exclusively Arabic nowadays. If you pay attention to this fact once, you shall find an abundance of similar examples over a very short period of time. This amazing fact does not fit into the consensual Scaligarian and Romanovian version of history. It alone suffices to make it perfectly clear that the history of the pre-Romanovian epoch must have drastically differed from how it is presented to us nowadays.